Welcome and Merry Christmas. As you can see, uh, we are full on in Christmas mode and ready to celebrate. And I don't know about you, but this is by far one of the most favorite times of year for me personally and our family. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of good, got a good memories being made. I'm sure you could, you would agree with that. Now, we do want to let you know that uh, as we look forward to Christmas Eve, We've got a couple of things planned. We've got in-person options. We've got online options. And to make it as easy as possible for you to share Christmas with someone in your life this year, we'd encourage you to take a moment. You could do that while you're here or when you get home. Visit us online at severn.cc slash Christmas at Severn. There you'll, you'll learn all about all of our service times and our in-person options and our online options as well. We cannot wait to celebrate with you and we hope to see you there at our christmas eve service yeah and the christmas eve service is just a super cool way to spend that time spend it together and, and if you look at the times you'll see there'll still be time after that for you to spend time with your family doing your own your own things in your home so we're really looking forward to that um, i wanted to mention two things we've been talking about a lot during this season and uh, two two ways that we can serve the uh, the community around us just opportunities for us to do that and uh, the first is our uh, joy for all initiative that we're doing where we're buying presents for families that are, are local around in the area who are in need and, and just need help getting Christmas presents for their children. So we've talked about this a lot, but we just want to continue to mention it in case you haven't heard or haven't signed up to do, be a part of it yet. And you can do that at severn.cc slash Christmas, um, or you can just stop out in the foyer if you're here in person and you can ask questions and find out what that's all about. Um, and then the other one I want to mention is our pop-up pantry coming up this Saturday on December 12th. It's actually our last pop-up pantry of the year uh, where we get to pass out uh, food and other essential items uh, to people in our community in need. And uh, we're going to do that at Quarterfield Elementary on Saturday from 1030 to 1230. And to be a part of that, you can sign up at severn.cc slash pop-up pantry. We'd love to see you at both of those different opportunities we have going on in the next week or two. Yeah, both of those opportunities really highlight the fact that you all are some of the most generous people on the planet with your time and your resources. And I do want to say that if you've yet to sponsor a child through Joy, Joy for All, we're down to the last six names. So thank you to those of you who have sponsored a child. We've got six more left today. And maybe, maybe you could grab one of those names off that tree and help us deliver the joy of Christmas to people right here in our community. And then as far as our pop-up pantry is concerned, I don't know if you guys were aware, but we've served close to 5,000 people right here in our very own community. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that is certainly something that we're grateful for. And I just want to say that it wouldn't be possible without the commitment of your time that you've made. Many of you have sacrificed your Saturdays to be able to deliver groceries to families right in our community. And so we're very, very thankful for that. And we're thankful to be able to gather together with you this morning. It's always a privilege. We count it in honor. And so let's go ahead and worship together. Merry Christmas. everyone let's all stand together we're just going to worship our king worship our our risen god this morning together now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign on the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives way for the risen one has overcome. And for everything there's an empty grave Jesus, as the heavens cry, let the earth respond. All creation shouts with the voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not, we will not be moved when the earth gives way for the risen one. Oh, there's an empty 
Jesus changes what we see and what we see for when you come in the room for when you do what only you can do it changes us changes what we see
how I'm supposed to top that. Thank you, worship team. And, uh, and thank you all for all uh, coming out to join us this morning, either in person or online. Uh, before I get into the, uh, the message this morning, I wanted to make a, a short 
hopefully short, but um, important announcement, and it's about Christmas Eve. So first and foremost this year, we are planning to have in-person, indoor uh, Christmas Eve services, which is a weird thing to have to have that many adjectives before it, but welcome to COVID church. And that's kind of what this announcement is about. Obviously, uh, you know, during church, uh, uh, doing church during this whole pandemic thing, I'm so tired of the phrase during this pandemic, uh, but during this pandemic, church uh, obviously looks and feels a lot different. And so um, we are, you know, we're managing a couple of tensions as we um, put these, uh, this Christmas Eve service together. And, and basically, uh, I wanted to give an announcement uh, just to ask you for your help. Uh, so, so here's just to kind of let you in on the thought process here. Obviously, first and foremost, we want to make sure that everybody who wants to come out and worship with us in person has the ability to do so on Christmas Eve. Uh, that being said, we know that a lot of people, uh, as, as this thing kind of drags on, are, you know, not quite comfortable coming out uh, in person to, 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 to gather and worship in a building. And so we were trying to think through what Christmas Eve is supposed to look like this year. So here's where we're at, and then uh, a, a request on your part. As of right now, we are planning to offer one uh, service on Christmas Eve at 4 p.m. The reason for 4 p.m. is because we didn't want to step on your toes as far as last-minute shopping, family plans, or, or Christmas Eve dinner. So we're going to do it at 4 p.m. Um, however, this is where I, uh, we need your help. So literally starting today, we are opening registration for the Christmas Eve service. And all I would ask you to do specifically this week, and even today, if you can get around to it, is go ahead, if you were planning on attending that service, 4 p.m. on Christmas Eve, to literally sign up for it today. That way we can get a feel for how many people are interested in coming out. Because if that service fills up, then we're, we're uh, definitely going to offer a second service at a time that will be announced if and when we have to get to it. Uh, but we figure this is the easiest way for us to figure out uh, how many services we should actually offer. So once more, as of right now, we're going to have one service on Christmas Eve at 4 p.m., but we need you to sign up and tell us whether or not you're coming to that service. If that fills up, then we're going to make more options available. Clear? That's as clear as I can make it, so hopefully that's clear. With that being said, thank you for bearing with that announcement. We are on, uh, we're on week 22 of our series from the book of Acts, which is all about the earliest history of Christianity. And so I'm going to read um, from Acts 26. I'm going to read verse 15 uh, all the way to the end of the chapter, which is verse 32. This is Paul speaking. Then I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and of what I will reveal to you. I will rescue you from the people and from the Gentiles. I now send you to them to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that by faith in me they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified." Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple complex and were trying to kill me. To this very day, I have obtained help that comes from God. And I stand and testify to both small and great, saying nothing else than what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah must suffer... And that as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. As he was making his defense this way, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, You're out of your mind, Paul. Too much study is driving you mad. But Paul replied, I'm not. A, <laughs> I love how matter of fact this is. I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment. For the king knows about these matters. It's to him I'm actually speaking boldly, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his notice since this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you, but all who listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains." I, would, uh, I, 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 I can't wait to talk to Paul. He just seems like a neat guy. Verse 30. So the king, the governor, Bernice, and those sitting with them got up. And when they had left, they talked with each other and said, This man's doing nothing that deserves death or chains. 
Then Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. And this is God's word. So if you, if you were with us last week, we actually, um, this is the second week that we're in chapter 26. What you have here is Paul is on trial before the most powerful people that he has ever stood before, powerful humans, I should say, he's ever stood before in his life. You have King Agrippa, who was king of Judea. You have uh, Festus, who was the royal imperial governor over Judea. And then you have kind of their, their whole entourage. Paul, if you remember, uh, actually several chapters ago, he's, he's in prison. He's been charged with a number of things like sedition and, and heresy. And so last week when we got into really the first half of chapter 26, we saw how Paul gives this defense, which is really just his testimony. It's a story of how he came uh, to know and to begin following after Jesus. But it's here at the end of his speech, which we're focusing on today, that we actually see the goal of Paul's speech. And what is crystal clear is Paul was never interested in defending himself. That's not why he opened his mouth and spoke the way that he did. If he did, he would not have said the things that he said the way that he said them. And, and, and frankly, the goal of his speech is actually surprising. It, it caught even King Agrippa off guard. And so I want to look at, at just three simple things today. I'm going to look first and foremost at um, what was Paul's goal. I want to look at how he went about achieving that, that goal. And then thirdly, where he got the boldness and the confidence and the power to do what he did here. So first and foremost, I want to ask the question, what was Paul's goal? And, it, and like I said, it's crystal clear that it was not defense. If you um, turn with me to, to Acts 26, verses 28 and 29, we just read this. It says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, Are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you but all who listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains. So Agrippa, at the end of Paul's defense, sort of realizes what Paul was after, and he says, hang on a second, Paul, are you trying to convert me? You know, are you trying to convert the king of Judea who holds your freedom in his hand? And Paul says, no, no, you, you misunderstand. I'm trying to convert everyone who can hear me right now. So that's Paul's goal here. Uh, very open and shut case, he's trying to persuade people to the truth of Christianity. Now, the next question I want to ask is, how does Paul go about that? And, and really, what, what we're asking is, and, and I just got into a conversation uh, about this this week, really what we're asking is, how does anybody get persuaded uh, that anything is true? The answer to that question very simply is, it's complicated. Um, in, in fact, when you start asking the question, how does somebody, I mean, even if you think about it in your own life, you believe the things that you believe for a whole host of reasons, many of which are probably unknown to us at the time. But when you start asking the question, how does someone get persuaded that something is true, really that question will take you back to the history of, of, of Western intellectual thought over the last 300 years, which is something I'm going to try to summarize in about 60 seconds here, if you'll give me, this, give me a shot. So about 300 years ago, we began something known as the Enlightenment Project. And the Enlightenment Project was this idea that, that you could come to certainty about something, uh, and, and, and really you can only come to certainty about something and be persuaded that something is true if it can be proven rationally and empirically. So, so this idea, the, the Enlightenment Project emphasized reason alone, that we should do away with God we should do away with faith, we should do away with religion, we should do away with beliefs and traditions and all that, uh, because we should only believe and we can only be persuaded by that which can be proven rationally and empirically. Now, that was 300 years ago that that mindset began to form, and, and obviously it's still influential today. I mean, I don't, you've probably heard people say something like this before, but lots of people even today will still say, uh, I can't believe in Christianity unless you prove it to me. But if you could just prove to me that God exists rationally and empirically, then I will believe that God exists. Those are, that's a mindset that's really influenced by the Enlightenment Project. What's important to note for, for you and I is that in our culture today, that mindset, believe it or not, is actually no longer the consensus. And, and probably the main reason for that is because the, the hope behind the Enlightenment Project when it began the hope was that if we would all just put away our beliefs and we would put away our faith and we would put away, you know, basically our feelings and our intuition and we just focused on what is rational and what can be proven, then 
you know, we'll come to consensus and we'll stop arguing all the time. Well, here we are 300 years later, and I'm just going to go ahead and say, yeah, that didn't happen. Okay, you, you look in any sphere of society today, we are as divided or, or maybe more divided, or maybe it's just clear how divided we are, whatever, than ever before. And when you see people argue, you know, if you have Twitter or, or Facebook, uh, because we're all blessed to be alive when those things are invented, uh, if you see people arguing on social media, what's interesting is everybody always believes, I'm just using my reason. I'm just being rational. It's everybody else that's being irrational. So this idea behind the Enlightenment Project, uh, that, that all you needed to persuade people was, was reason, a lot of people have correctly said, yeah, that's not accurate. You know, the reason that people believe things, the reason that people are persuaded by things, it's, it's reason, but it's also a whole lot of other things. So, so today, in our postmodern culture, what we're seeing, I guess what we've seen really, is kind of the pendulum swinging the other way. And now, more and more people are saying, you know what, you really can't believe that anything's true. And, and, and really, people only believe what they believe because that's what their culture tells them to believe. You know, they're socially conditioned to hold the beliefs that they hold. And so according to that mindset, you, uh, it said, you believe what you believe just because that's what your family or your culture raised you to believe. Uh, and th there actually is, I think there's at least a shred of truth buried in there. Because studies have shown that, that as people, we have a tendency uh, to, find, um, to find arguments plausible when they're held by either people that we like or people that we really want to like us. And that's why, I mean, I don't know how many times you see this, but that's why you'll see a child raised in a, you know, a traditional religious home. They seemingly adopt the views of their parents, but then they go off to a secular university, and now they're surrounded by a community of people who look down on people who hold the beliefs that they were raised in, and so now, all of a sudden, they abandon the beliefs of their parents and they adopt the views of their new community. The reason for that is because, you know, we all want to fit in. People are relational creatures, and people tend to believe things not just because they're rational, but because those beliefs help us feel included in a particular community. So if you go to either one of these extremes, and I'm going to get, get a little bit intellectual here. If you go to, to um, either one of these extremes... And, and say, on the one hand, if you say, you must never believe anything unless it can be empirically proven, uh, think about that statement for a second. If, if somebody tells me that I should not believe anything unless it can be empirically proven, one question that a statement like that raises is, can you empirically prove that statement? In other words, can you empirically prove to me that I should only believe something if it can be empirically proven? And the answer is no, you can't. That statement is actually a faith statement. So believe it or not, that statement literally fails its own criteria. It's a, it's a fallacy. But if you try to go the other way and you say, uh, you know what, there's really no way to tell what's true and what's not true. Everybody just believes whatever they're raised to believe. Think about what you're actually saying there. What you're saying is uh, there is no such thing as universal truth because people simply believe what they're socially conditioned to believe. But if that statement is true, then what you just said must not be universally true, and you only believe it because you've been conditioned to believe it, so I don't have to believe that either. Now, I understand we're getting kind of meta here on a Sunday morning, but my, my point is that neither one of those mindsets work. And, and both of them, when, when it comes to, to answering the question, why is it that people hold the beliefs that they hold, um, and, and why are they persuaded by the things they're persuaded by, the truth is that, that either one of those extremes, they, they, they're, they're too shallow in understanding of people. All right, the, 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 uh, the point that I'm driving at here, which I said on the front end, is that persuasion is a very complicated thing. And the reason for that is because people are made in the image of God. And as beings created in the image of God, we are incredibly complex, multifaceted beings. I've said this before, and I think it bears repeating here. There really is no philosophy, there is no theory, and there is no other belief system that will honor the complexity of your being like the Word of God will. Because the Word of God says that you are made in the image of God. And part of what that means is that you know, to be made in the image of God means that on the one hand, you are a rational being, and yet you also have emotions. And Scripture will never reduce you to one or the other. Scripture says that, you know, being made in the image of God means you are a physical being, and yet there are non-physical elements to your being. You have a spiritual aspect, you know, a soul, a spirit, a mind, a heart, a will. Uh, scripture also teaches that you are an individual, yet part of what it means to be created in the image of God is that you are a highly relational, social being. 
And so because human beings are so complex and multifaceted, uh, this idea of persuasion is too. So, the, the, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, if you believe anything, whatever it is that you believe, whether you believe that Christianity is true or whether you have doubts about Christianity, your beliefs are always the result of a number of things, a number of things at work, many of which we're probably not even aware of in ourselves. In saying that, uh, I, I want to be clear, of course, you should have a reason for believing whatever it is you believe. There should be a rationality to your belief. That's very biblical. First Peter 3.15 talks about uh, having a reason for the hope that is in you. Um, and, and so, you know, when somebody says, you know, the reason that I believe in God is because I feel it in my heart, that's, if that's the only answer that you have, that's really not a good place to be. Because it's not going to be very long before your feelings change. Anybody who's lived more than a half hour should be able to say amen to that. And if the only foundation for your faith is your feelings, then pretty soon you're not going to have a foundation for your faith. So you and I should have, a, there should be a rationality to whatever it is that we believe. However, because Scripture's clear we're more than just rational beings, our reason is not going to take us all the way home. And, and here's a before I move on, let me just give an uh, illustration here that I think perfectly improve, uh, uh, proves this. Picture for a moment, and I know this is easier uh, for some of you because we have you know, small business owners and stuff like that in our church, uh, but, but here's a thought experiment. Picture that you're an employer and you want to hire somebody, but you want empirical proof that this candidate before you is the perfect candidate for the job before you hire them. If you've ever been in a position to have to hire people, you know that it doesn't work that way. If you demand empirical proof that this candidate is the perfect candidate for the job, before you hire them, then you're never going to hire anybody. All right, now, if that doesn't mean that you should not use reason, your own ability to, to, to make reasonable choices in the hiring process. Of course you could, but you need to accept the fact that, that your own reason has limitations. All right, when you're talking about vetting somebody for a position in the company, your reason can really only get you to the place where you can say, okay, this person is probably the best candidate for the job, because that's how far reason can get us. Reason, our own reason, can get us to probability. But eventually, you're going to have to commit. Eventually, you're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to hire this person. And it's really on the other side of commitment that you're going to arrive at certainty. Maybe it'll be six months. Maybe it'll be two years down the road. But only after commitment will you be able to tell with certainty that that was or was not the best person for the job. So reason might get you to probability but it takes commitment to get you to certainty. And so I say all of this to just repeat the point that I've already made, that, that persuasion, the concept of why people become persuaded to hold anything is true, is a very complicated idea. And in saying that, let me, let me kind of pivot to the text here. What's really clear is that Paul, because of the ability, uh, he, he, the way that he would persuade people the truth of Christianity, Paul knew that. Paul knew that, that, um, that it takes more than just one kind of argument to persuade people because here he is, he's out to persuade King Agrippa and Festus and their entourage and the most powerful cultural elites of his day. And when you look at how Paul went about doing that, he went about that in a highly sophisticated, multifaceted way. And what I want to pull out of this text with the time that we have left is three arguments that Paul puts forth that are really um, three reasons for why Christianity makes so much sense. Before I get to our first idea today, let me just state the purpose of this message. Uh, as a, as a, you know, a pastor, and, and you know, there's people listening to this that have pastored before, so this will make sense to you. When you put together messages, you realize before it's time to deliver them, different messages have different purposes. Some are, are designed to, to convict people. Some are designed to uplift people. Some are designed to, you know, really give people an emotionally moving experience. I'm going to tell you straightforwardly what the purpose of this teaching is. It, it is really just one purpose for it. This teaching is designed to build your faith, period. So if, 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 if I do my job today, then if you are a Christian, you should leave here today more confident than you were, you know, a half hour before that there are solid, there is a solid foundation for your Christian faith perhaps even more solid than you realized before you came to church today. If you're listening to this and you're skeptical, you have doubts about Christianity, then my goal is Paul's goal. I want to persuade you. I want to at least get you to the point where you consider the evidence because there's a whole lot of it. So all of that to say, let's get to our first of three ideas today. Number one, it's that Christianity makes sense rationally. Christianity makes rational sense. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 26, verse 24. It says this, as he, being Paul, was making his defense this way, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, you're out of your mind, Paul. 
Too much study is driving you mad. So just before these words, Paul had just finished explaining that he met Jesus on the road to Damascus because Jesus had been raised from the dead. And it's Festus who, who kind of interrupts him, interrupts him here, but remember who Festus is. Festus is a Gentile. So he's an outsider. He's a Gentile, pagan outsider. He's kind of coming into, you know, all of Paul's beliefs and the Jewish faith, for that matter, cold. And so he's interrupting Paul here, and he's basically pointing out what any outsider would point out in Paul. He's saying, Paul, this is crazy. You're telling us that a dead Jewish carpenter came back to life, and now he's the risen son of God. Do you even hear what you're saying out loud? It's, it's, it's absurd that you would ask anybody to believe this. But now I want, I want you to look at how Paul responds to Festus. Because the way that he responds to him, he, he, does, he just doesn't sound like a guy who's making this up. It, in the next verse, verse 25, it says, But Paul replied, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, remarkably respectful to a man that just badly disrespected him. He said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment. Now, I, I want you to see here what Paul does not do. Because a lot of times when people get challenged the way that Paul was challenged, they immediately go inside. They immediately go internal. They go to the emotions. Paul does not say, Festus, I know it sounds crazy, but Jesus changed my life. And if you just believe, if you just exercise blind faith, he'll change yours too. Instead, what Paul does here is he offers a, an airtight, very difficult to argue with, rational appeal. Because in the next verse, it says this. Now he's talking to Agrippa. He says, for the king knows about these matters. It's to him I'm actually speaking boldly, for I'm convinced that none of these things escapes his notice since this was not done in a corner. And what, what Paul is saying, he's, he's basically saying to Festus, Festus, I get it. You're an outsider. You don't think like we think. You don't live how we live. And you weren't raised in all of this. So I get why this sounds crazy to you coming in cold. However, Agrippa was different. Agrippa's family lived in Judea for generations. What we, we know historically, Agrippa would have been about eight years old when Jesus died, and so he grew up in the aftermath of, of you know, Jesus' ministry. And, and so the reason that Paul uh, could speak with the boldness and the confidence and, frankly, the poise that he just answered Festus with here and the fact that he could e even address the king as boldly as he did is because Paul knew something. He knew that nobody could have, have lived in or around Jerusalem over the last 20 years and just laughed off what he was saying. Because, as he said, this stuff didn't happen in a corner. There was a whole lot of evidence that was actually on the hearer to disprove. That's the, 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 the confidence that Paul had. So let's ask the question, well, what is Paul referring to when he says this wasn't done in a corner? And there's really just two things I want to focus on. First and foremost, let's think about the miracles of Jesus. All right, when you read the gospel accounts, what's clear is there were dozens of extremely public extremely astounding miracles that on several occasions uh, were seen by thousands of people at one time. And we know from the end of John's gospel account that the, the miracles recorded in the gospels are just a fraction of all that Jesus actually did during his three-year public ministry. And so what that meant, think about this, at, is that at the time of Paul's trial, literally while he was saying these words to Agrippa, there were still thousands and thousands and thousands of people alive who had actually seen one of Jesus' miracles firsthand. So Paul's argument was not, I've had a divine revelation and you got to trust me. Paul's argument was, hey, you guys saw this. You have to figure out what you believe about it, but don't act like it happened in a corner. So, so here, here's, a, here's, this is a scenario that would have taken place thousands and thousands of times, you know, during Paul and Agrippa's lifetime. You can picture two men walking down the road. And they hear about this new kind of sect of Judaism. What, you know, they, I think they call themselves the way or Christianity. And one of them says, man, these guys are a bunch of whack job zealots. They got these weird ideas. I wish they'd just go away. And, and you know, he says this to his friend. But you can picture his friend could say, yeah, you know, the, the, the Christians really do sound weird. And, and I, I get that, you know, they have some strange beliefs. But, uh, you know, I was at the wedding feast at Cana. And I know that we ran out of wine early. But apparently Jesus got together with the servants and he filled these kind of jars up with water, and it became the best wine that we'd ever had, and I'm still trying to figure out how he did that if he was just a man. Or, or picture how many thousands of people would have been alive when Jesus fed the 5,000, which actually it was just 5,000 men, probably more than 10,000 people, women and children. You know, I wonder how many people would have had to say, you know, I'm not really sure what I think about Jesus, but I was there that day, and I saw five loaves and two fish feed thousands and thousands and thousands of people to the point that we had 12 baskets of leftovers. I'm still trying to figure out what he what he did there. 
Or even, here's, here's probably even a harder one to deal with. Imagine the friends of Lazarus that saw him die. Lazarus had friends in his life. So you know that there were people that said, hey, I was with Lazarus when he was drawing his last breath. And I saw Martha and Mary and the grief that they experienced. I actually helped load him into his tomb. And I was there four days later when Jesus rolled up. You could smell Lazarus before you saw his tomb. And then he walked out of it because Jesus told him to. So I don't know, <laughs> amen. So I don't know what to do with that, but you, but you gotta do something with that. And that's why Paul is saying, hey, you have to figure out what to do with this evidence because this didn't happen in a corner. Those are just the miracles of Jesus. Obviously, the most, the most uh, persuasive or compelling part of Christianity was the fact of the empty tomb. Because Paul went on to say in 1 Corinthians 15 that over 500 people at one time saw the risen son of God. Now, let me just point something out to you individuals have hallucinations. There might be a few of them in this room that have had some a time or two, all right? No judgment, okay? We're all, it's level footing at the foot of the cross, you know what I mean? So, but my point is, individuals can have hallucinations, all right? Maybe Paul, if he was on the road to Damascus by himself, okay, maybe he, whatever, got heat stroke and thought he saw Jesus, great. Maybe Peter in the middle of the night, you know, just he, he really wanted to believe that this rabbi that invested in this fisherman, you know, came back and had a purpose for his life. 500 people don't have the same hallucination. We have not invented that drug yet, okay? 500 people don't imagine the same thing. And, it, and not only that, but at the time of Paul's trial, people were already dying rather than denying the resurrection. Some of them were dying at the hands of Paul before he himself converted to Christianity. People were already dying for this thing, and you don't die for a hoax. So here's the point. Paul makes this incredibly rational case for Christianity. And what that means, first and foremost, for Christians, I think this is something that's important for us to remember. Our faith does not rest on blind faith. Our faith rests on historical facts that took place in history. And I'll just tell you, the idea of blind faith wouldn't have even made sense to Paul. It wouldn't have made sense to any of the first followers of Jesus. If becoming a Christian required an exercise of blind faith, even though none of it made sense, you think Paul, who knew the Old Testament scriptures like the back of his hand, would have believed this? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. People would not have died for this thing. Our faith, the Christian faith, rests on events that literally took place in history. And if you're here, and, and that's for Christians, if you're here and you're kind of skeptical about this or you're doubting this, let me just offer this to you. Based on Paul's argument here, here's, here's what this means for, for you personally. You should never reject Christianity simply because you don't like it. And, and actually, I'll go further than that. You shouldn't even evaluate Christianity based on whether or not you like it. And the reason I say that is because Paul didn't like it. If, if you're offended by some of the things that you find in the Bible, if you're offended by some of the things that, that you know, are considered tenets of Christianity, just understand, Paul was more offended than you were. He killed Christians. He's more offended than you were. But Paul did not become, Paul's testimony is not, I became a Christian because I really liked it. He hated it. Paul did not become a Christian because he liked it. He became a Christian because he could not deny it. It stared him in the face and he couldn't deny it any longer. So first and foremost, Christianity makes rational sense. But, and this is important to see, Paul does not offer a strictly rational case because like I said on the front end here, we are not just rational beings. Nobody embraces Christianity on reason alone. And, and, and on the other side of that, nobody rejects Christianity on reason alone as much as they might tell themselves that. Usually you have a bad experience, you sense hypocrisy, Somebody in the name of God did something, whatever it is. But nobody gets all the way in or, or walks all the way out of faith purely on reason alone. And so here's where Paul goes next, and this is going to be our second idea. Number two, Christianity makes sense emotionally. Christianity actually makes emotional sense. All right, if you look at the entire discourse of Acts chapter 26, which like I said, we started last time, uh, at, at the top of it, what Paul is doing is he's giving his testimony if you remember this from last time. On the front end of, of his discourse here, what he basically says is, hey, this is my, my name's Paul, this is my story. I was a Pharisee. I lived according to the strictest sect of the Jewish law, and, and I lived to honor that law. I lived to honor the law of God. That was his meaning in life. But at a certain point in his life, and Paul really kind of lets us in to the inner workings of his heart in Romans chapter 7, which was you know, before he got saved, um, Paul talks about what went on in his heart, what went on in his life, what went on for him emotionally, 
uh, before and, and what ultimately led to him becoming a Christian. Uh, so if, if, if you have the time to read Romans 7, I'm not going to do it today, but I would, I would encourage you to take a look at it this week. What, what's clear from Romans 7, obviously written by Paul, is that at some point in his life before coming to, to follow Jesus, Paul was studying the Ten Commandments. And he'd been raised in them. He knew his whole life, knew them his whole life. But I guess he was, he was kind of like meditating on them. And, uh, and he, he says something really interesting. He says that he got to the Tenth Commandment. In the Tenth Commandment, it says not to covet. He says that commandment came home and it killed him. Or if you, if you read from the, the King James, the King Jimmy version, it says it slew him. It came home and slew him. What that means is Paul started really meditating on, really reflecting on this command to not covet, and it actually, it killed him. So what on earth does that mean? If, if you read the first nine commandments, Jesus said you really can't do this. But if you do read the first nine commandments, it's possible to kind of kid yourself and read them in a strictly behavioral sense. Meaning you can look at the first nine and it'll say, you know, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't lie, honor your parents, uh, don't kill anybody, no adultery, no, you know, don't bow down to false gods. You can read those first nine commandments behaviorally and think, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at that, or at least I'm, I'm, I'm better than other people at that. But you can't do that with the 10th commandment. Because the, the, the commandment, thou shalt not covet, that is, that is an exclusively internal command that really can't be understood behaviorally. And, and when the Bible talks about not coveting, what that m- command means in a positive sense, it means that you should love God and you should trust God so much that you are content no matter what situation you find yourself in in life. Now, Paul, evidently, at some point before him becoming a Christian, he thought about that command. Instead of just being able to kind of recite it, he really internalized that, and it dawned on him that he couldn't do that. Because no human being can do that. Nobody can just decide to trust and love God that much. And when that dawned on him, when he realized that he could not keep this command, uh, and that's just one of the 10. I mean, there's, there's about 650 of these commands in the Old Testament. When he realized that he could not keep one of the big 10, it kind of created this, uh, this psychological, existential, spiritual crisis in his life. And it was a crisis because that was the main thing that he was building his life on. The main thing that he was living for was to, to, to honor God's law. And here that law showed him exactly how far he fell short, that he was, he was infinitely far away from being what that law required him to be. Uh, and, and so if you looked at Paul prior to him becoming a Christian, on the outside, Paul was marked by a sense of superiority, which led to condescension and all kinds of self-righteousness. But what Paul would say after he came to know Jesus is that if you got just below the surface there, Paul's life was marked by an incredible feeling of inferiority, all kinds of insecurity, and this constant fear that he didn't measure up because he was, being, he was literally being eaten up inside. Um, and, and then the gospel was revealed to him. That's when the gospel began to make sense to him. And when the gospel dawned on him, he realized that the thing that he wanted most in life, which was, which was to honor God's law, could only be fulfilled if he gave his life to Jesus. Uh, because he wanted to honor the law of God, but he came to understand, and he even says it in this discourse, that Jesus was the only one who, who did that. Jesus is the only one who perfectly lived to honor God's law. And so Paul realized that the gospel is teaching that even though he had fallen short, Jesus lived the perfect life that he could never live. And then going to the cross, he died the death that he himself should have died, paying the penalty for all of Paul's law breaking. When he understood that, he understood that the thing that he wanted the most in life, the only thing that could satisfy the deepest longings of his heart was a relationship with Jesus. And so what the gospel did for Paul, this is what it has to do for all of us if we're really going to be persuaded and brought into faith. What the gospel did for Paul was, it was essentially two things. First and foremost, it helped him understand the turmoil in his life. But then, secondly, it resolved that turmoil for him. Just like a surgeon, what the gospel did is it ripped open Paul, and then it healed him. It sewed him back up, and it put him back together. Now, in in giving that that kind of uh, analogy here, uh, I I realize that probably nobody listening to this is an Orthodox Jew or a Pharisee, uh, but what we all need to see is exactly what Paul came to understand, which is that Christianity makes not only rational but even emotional sense. Meaning Christianity, and and I'm going to make a bold statement here, only Christianity will help you make sense of your life. Every single one of us needs to understand that. Not just in an intellectual, rational sense, but in a deeply personal, emotional sense. 
See, and you can hear the gospel your whole life. And, and I mean, especially for those of us that were raised in Christian families or, or you know, in the church, you, you, th- this hits home for you, what I'm about to say. You can hear the gospel your whole life. You know, that you're a sinner that needs salvation, but we all tend to look for salvation outside of God. But in Jesus, God has freely offered us this gift of salvation. You can hear that message your whole life, but until it comes home for you, meaning until on the one hand the gospel shows you what's wrong with you, until you begin to understand how you've looked to other things or maybe other people to be and do for you what only Jesus can be and do for you, and that really is the primary source of turmoil in your life. That it's not about out here, it's about in here. When the gospel shows that to you on the one hand, but then on the other hand, the gospel also begins to resolve that turmoil and fulfill you. Now, now for Paul, you see, he was living to honor the law of God. Most people aren't living for that. Most people in our culture are living for things like love, or they're living for beauty, or they're living for acceptance, or they're living for comfort, or they're living for, you know, security, or whatever it is. But it's only when you and I begin to see that in Jesus, and only in Jesus, the plot lines of our lives can connect and resolve. That, that it's in Jesus, and it's only in Jesus that the deepest longings of my heart can be fulfilled. Then and only then does the gospel begin to make more than just rational, but also emotional sense to us. Then and only then does the gospel begin to make sense of our lives personally, and we need that if we're going to be brought all the way into a life-changing faith. And it's really just the process of understanding that over and over again that we grow in our relationship with Jesus. So first and foremost, the gospel makes sense rationally. Secondly, it makes sense emotionally. But even that is not all that Paul had to say here. And th- this brings us to our third, and, and it'll be our last idea during our time together. It's number three, that, that Christianity makes biblical sense. It makes sense biblically. And you see this in verses 22 and 23 where Paul says, To this very day I've obtained help that comes from God, and I stand and testify to both small and great, I love this, saying nothing else than what the prophets and Moses said would take place that the Messiah must suffer, and that as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. What Paul is saying here is not only does Christianity make rational sense, that it's based on events that literally took place in history, and and then not only does the gospel make emotional sense, that it, it personally made sense of his life for him, but he's also going on to say that the gospel, Christianity, is the only thing that can really help you make sense of the Bible. Because Paul knew the scriptures his whole life. Paul had been raised on the law and the prophets, which really was, was all that, it, it, that existed prior to Paul's life. Paul had been raised on them. Paul had, had probably memorized huge chunks of them. But what, he, what, what he's saying here is that it was only when he understand how all of it led him to Jesus. It was only when he understood that Jesus was the fulfillment of everything that he read in scripture that scripture finally came alive for him. I don't know how many times this has happened in my life, I know if you've been a follower of Jesus for any length of time, you can say this. And it's amazing how often you'll hear this connected with a conversion story or a reawakening story. I don't know how many times it's it's so common when somebody for the very first time comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, even if they've read the Bible before, they say, this book's just not the same anymore. The truth is the book is the same. It's you who have been changed. Your eyes have been opened. Or or, or when you've been in the faith for a long time and there's been a period of kind of dryness or stagnation, you have a reignition, you have a reawakening. It's one of the clearest signs of that is, and it's like this is a living and active word again. It's not because the book's changing, it's because you have. And and the reason that we need this last aspect, the reason this is worth talking about, is because really the place where the rational and the emotional come together in a way that's convincing is in the context of the biblical. That's why we need, there's no substitute for spending a whole lot of time in the word of God. Amen. Amen. Because when you see, specifically in the gospel accounts, when you see Jesus, when you look at Jesus, when you focus on the person of Jesus, what, what happens is Jesus, Jesus ultimately is the, the, the ultimate argument for the truth of Christianity. Jesus is the word made flesh. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And when you see him, what you're being presented with, page after page, is, is really a rational and emotional argument, the case for Christianity. In Jesus, because when you study the life of Jesus, if you do so for any length of time, eventually you're going to find yourself thinking, people couldn't have made this up. You don't invent a literary character like Jesus. This could not be the invention of mankind. That's a very rational argument for Jesus. But on the other hand, you're going to see how beautiful he is and how majestic he is and how sovereign and how powerful he is. 
and how there's, he's, a, he's a God man who is the embodiment of full grace and full truth, and that appeals to the emotions in a way that nothing else can. And so it's in the context of the biblical that the rational and the emotional come together in a way that brings you all the way into faith. And I, there's actually a really good friend of mine at our church who's been here for a long time. This is his testimony. He said when he was skeptical and he was standing outside the gates of Christianity, but he wanted to know, is there substance to what this book says? He just decided, he, he said, I'm going to be done with all the noise. I just want to figure out who Jesus is. And he read the gospel accounts, and he looked at, at what Jesus said, and he looked at what Jesus did, and he looked at who Jesus ate with, and who he associated with, and who he invited to follow him, and who he reserved his harshest words for. And ultimately, it wasn't what anybody else said to him. It wasn't anything else he heard. It was seeing the person of Jesus that brought him all the way into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So thirdly and lastly, the Bible makes sense biblically. But I want to I close today by, by asking uh, maybe an interesting question, if we can kind of zoom out from Paul's argument and get like a bird's eye view. Let me ask the question, where did Paul get the boldness and the confidence and the poise to deliver any of this argument to begin with? Right, Paul is standing before King Agrippa, King of Judea. He's standing before uh, the, the Roman imperial governor of Judea, Festus. He's standing before the most powerful people that he has seen to date in his life. Just to put that in layman's terms, I mean, imagine if you were brought before the Supreme Court or Congress or the president or various world leaders, and they said, prove Christianity. I, 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 maybe you're different than me. I don't know that I would have the kind of clarity and confidence that Paul has here. And so the question that I'm, I'm left asking is, where does Paul get the poise that he has, the confidence that he has, the peace, the controlled strength to even respond and present and actually go on the offensive. He puts, he puts King Agrippa on his toes. King Agrippa has the power to, to release him, to save him, to spare him a really nasty death. And Paul puts that guy on it. He basically has to run away from Paul and saying, I'm not ready to do this, Give me, you know, and he runs away. So where does that kind of strength come from? And there's an answer to that in verse 18. This is going to be the last verse I read today. In verse 18, Paul is quoting Jesus and in this verse, what we see is the, what we're, what we're seeing is the fruit of salvation. What we're seeing in verse 18 is what Jesus stands ready to all who come to him by grace through faith in his name. It says, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. And this is Jesus speaking, that by faith in me, they may receive two things, forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified. To receive something means you get it as a gift. You don't have to do anything to earn it. By faith in Jesus, you receive these two things, according to this verse, forgiveness of sins and a share. Now, if you read this verse in other versions, for instance, if you have the ESV, it's going to translate that word share as a place. And the reason for that is because the Greek word used there literally means a home. And you know what a home is. A home is far more than a place that you just sleep and eat. A home is a place where you're welcome. A home is a place where you can find rest. A home is a place where you belong. A, a home is a place where you're loved. And what this verse teaches, straight from the mouth of Jesus, according to the Apostle Paul, is the moment you put your trust in Jesus, you are not just forgiven of your sins, you are given a home. That means the gospel says you are not only free to go, the gospel says you're free to come home. We're almost done here. I just wanted to leave you with a, with a story that I hope drives this idea home. Because this ha this, if this is going to change our lives, this has got to be more than just an abstract principle. This has got to be something that we experience. This week I had the chance to do something I have never, ever done before. I spoke at a chapel service for my son's elementary school to kindergartners through fifth graders. If you know me personally, you know I never do stuff like that. I will find every reason to talk myself out of doing things like that for a whole bunch of other reasons that I don't have the time to get into or the security to reveal to you. So let's just keep moving. Anyway, I decided since my son goes to this school and the principal personally asked me, and perhaps I'll knock a few bucks off tuition if I'm being honest, maybe I'll just go ahead and teach it. So they asked me several weeks in advance to put this teaching, and they gave me this text and this topic, and I said, okay. I'll... So anyway... As the weeks were rolling on and, uh, and, and, you know, this day was getting closer and closer, 
I was talking with Katie. I was laying, I was laying in bed one night, and I found myself getting kind of nervous and anxious about this chapel service. And I said, Katie, how insecure do you have to be to get nervous at the thought of talking to kindergartners through fifth graders about Jesus? And there was an awkward silence in my bedroom. And I said, anyway, I'm exactly that insecure. So the days continued to move forward, and I hadn't really had the chance to sit down and think about what I wanted to say and, and, and write it out. And I came home from work one day, and I was, I was tired. I was tired, church. Anybody else tired? Everybody's tired. So I was sitting on the couch, and Everett comes up to me, and he's got this notebook. And it's, it's a big deal. Everett's notebook is like a sacred tome. He does not let it, you know, he, that's a hands-off notebook. He doesn't let anybody read his notebook. So he comes up to me with this notebook. I'm sitting on the couch. He sits right next to me, and he says, hey, Dad, can I show you something? I said, yeah. And he opens up his notebook, and he shows me two pages. And on these pages, he had drawn pictures of, of me and him. And in one of the pictures, we were hugging, and in another picture, we were playing. And underneath both of these pictures, he wrote how much he loved me and how he thought I was the best dad. And I, I'll tell you, and I think you understand, that when I read those words at that very moment, uh, all of that fear, all of that apprehension, all of those nerves, they just, they were gone. Uh, matter of fact, I could have I could have preached a chapel service in a lion's den right then and there if you'd asked me to. I could have marched to the gates of hell and preached the service if you had asked me to. Because that's the effect that love has on a human heart. Now, with that idea in mind, let me just offer this to you. I've been hearing so much lately and reading so much lately and really trying to focus on the importance of preaching to the heart. Because like I said on the front end of this story, it's one thing to read that your sins have been forgiven and you have a home with God. It's one thing to, to know that intellectually. It's another thing for that to rest from your head to your heart in a way that actually transforms us. So if I, if I can, can I just try to preach to your heart for a minute here? Can I just try to aim at your affections here for a moment? We're almost done. But with, with that story in mind, let me just offer you this. If that's the effect that a child's love can have on a human heart, can I ask you to think, what does it really mean? What does it really mean that you are loved by the King of Kings? What does it actually mean that the Son of God died for you, rose again for you, has gone ahead of you to prepare a place for you so that you will find a home in the presence of your heavenly Father, the moment that your final breath escapes and you stand before him. You start thinking about these ideas for any length of time, and the question quickly becomes not, how do I have the confidence that Paul had, but how could I have anything less? How can anything ever command my fear again? How can anything ever intimidate me? I want to I call the worship team up, and we're going to close today, but, but let me say this. Paul understood the gospel. Paul understood that he was loved, that he was cherished, that he had a home with the ultimate king of the universe, and that fact made him fearless before every other king he stood with. And when you believe the gospel, and what I mean is when you see God opening his notebook in front of you and telling you how much he loves you, that he did not spare his own son to bring you into his family, when that becomes real to you, Nothing will be able to intimidate you. Nothing will be able to unseat you. Nothing will be able to crush you. The final thing that we learn from Acts chapter 26, from Paul's defense, is very simply this. If you want to be persuasive for the gospel, you must be persuaded by the gospel. And to the degree that you are, to the degree that this becomes real to you, you will have peace, you will have confidence, you will have boldness wherever your heavenly Father sees fit to lead you. So the application to this message might be the simplest application I'll ever offer. You know what it is? Believe the gospel. Just believe the gospel. That's it. That's all. Let me pray for us. Father, I just want to thank you for everything that we read is already ours by grace through faith in the name of Jesus, according to Acts chapter 26, verse 18, that the moment we put our trust in Jesus, we are forgiven for our sins, and we have a share. We have a place. We have a home waiting for us on the other side of this life. No one and nothing can take it from us. 
God, would you just, would you just make us a community of people that believe that more than we believe anything else? God, would you make us a group of people who believe and live out the implications of the gospel by grace through faith in the name of the risen king of the universe. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in all his love for me. All his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child.
another week as we count down the days till Christmas. You know, it's hard to believe there are only about four weeks left in this year we call 2020, and what a crazy year it has been. You know, but whatever this year has felt like for you personally, I want to assure you that God is the same yesterday, He'll be the same today, and He'll definitely be the same tomorrow, whatever tomorrow brings. So our God, he's a, he's a faithful God. His promises are true and his grace and his mercy is new and it's fresh every single morning. You know, I hope that you've enjoyed spending this time with us, but I pray specifically that today God spoke to you in a personal way either through our time in worship and song or through the truth that God spoke to us through Pastor Ryan today. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.